Hello, hello. Marty Reed here with Positive Coaching Alliance. Come on in and join us. Give us a wave. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us. Give us a wave. Let us know where you're dialing in from. I'm super excited for our special guest today. So um, today we are going to have the former UCLA head gymnastics coach, Miss Val, joining us pretty soon here. Now, for those of you who don't know about Miss Val, I mean, she's a recently retired after 29 years with UCLA as a head coach after winning seven NCAA titles, seven, okay? NCAA title uh, championships. She was inducted into the UCLA Hall of Fame and she was named Coach of the Century, okay? And she's also an author of Life is, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. So I'm very excited to have our special guest today and we're gonna join, she's gonna join in in a moment. Oh, she just said hi to everyone. Hi, Miss Val. Yes, we're gonna join in. Um, so those of you who are joining in to the call right now, give us a hi, let us know where you're um, tuning in from. And also, you know, send this out to your friends, let them know that we are going live and just, if, or we're gonna start our session in just a few moments here, okay? So we'll just have Miss Val request to join in on the session and we'll get started soon. If you have questions throughout the session, please feel free to leave them in the comments or in the question box. I'll try to get through it. I'll try to get to your questions. And I'm so glad that you all are here to learn. Kip Fit, Miss Val Rock, so excited to hear and learn. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we'll get started in just a couple moments here. We'll give you all a little bit more time to join in on the call. Alrighty, alrighty. Okay, so Ms. Val will have you request to join the call, request to join in to go live with me, and then we can both, everyone can see our faces pretty soon. So you'll have to request to uh, join in so everyone can see your face, okay? Once you uh, come into the call, you can request to join in and we can go live together. All right, PCA Los Angeles in the house. Hey, hey friends. Hi, Casey Miller, thanks for joining. Give us a wave everyone, let us know where you're tuning in from, okay? See right now. All right, I'm joining in. We'll get her in pretty soon, okay? I know Ms. Val's on the call right now. She's in the comments. I just requested uh, for her to join in with me and uh, you can accept it here as more and more people are joining, yes. All right, give us a wave. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Again, this is Marty Reed with Positive Coaching Alliance. And we're gonna have former UCLA head gymnastics coach, Miss Val on our call today once she joins. Um, all right, I should join in pretty soon. All right. Okay. Just a moment, please join in. Go live, here we go. There she is, <laughs> hi! <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, I don't know about you, but every time I go on one of these, which has been like, I feel like I've done a million of them. My heart have. starts racing. I'm like, what's going on? Why can't I get on? What's happening? What? I've done this a million times. So I, know, I apologize. I 
Hey, everybody, I apologize. To too. No worries. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Of oh my course. God, I'm so excited. Well, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Yes. And I know you just joined on one of our um, sessions with the LA chapter last night. So I appreciate you for doing that as well and taking the time to be with us today. But I mean, we have so many coaches on the line now. We have athletes. We have parents, too. And um, I would love to just jump right in. I mean, I believe that your coaching philosophy is spot on in line with Positive Coaching Alliance mission of creating better athletes and better people. I mean, you mentioned your coaching philosophy as developing champions in life through sport. Can you just dive into that and tell us what that means to you? Yeah. Um, well, for anybody who doesn't know, I was never a, a, a competitive athlete. I was a ballet dancer. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you can argue that that's an athlete, but I never played competitive sports. Like in ballet, you don't dance to win, right? You perform, right? So when I was asked to be the head coach of UCLA gymnastics, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but more importantly, Marty, I didn't know why I was going to accept mm -hmm. the job. And so I, I just figured out really quickly that I felt like there are coaches who coach to win. Right. And it's all about the X's and O's. And that wasn't me. Because mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in that win at all cost type of mentality. Yeah. Then there are coaches that love the process and love the fact that athletics is truly, in my opinion, a masterclass on really, really, really tough life lessons. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited to develop champions in life. So not just focusing on the athletic part of the, the athlete, but the whole person mm -hmm. that's the athlete. So I'm going to develop that whole person into this superhero, into yeah. this like amazing human being. And that became my why. That became my driving force as to why I was going to coach. Yeah, and absolutely. And I feel like when you focus on the whole human being, the athlete, beyond just the X's and O's, you still end up winning. I mean, you are not, you won so many championships. You're a Hall of Fame coach. So, um, so those coaches out there that might believe that, you know, winning is just so important. You can't not, you know, develop these athletes without focusing on that part. How do we make sure that we're keeping the game and sports fun and still competing and winning, but not sacrificing, you know, the, the human spirit? Because, you know what, any, first of all, I believe that almost every single human being on the planet has a competitive drive in them. You know, it may be to win at chess, or it may be to win at a video game. Um, it doesn't have to be this physical exertion, but I feel like there's this competitiveness in all of us. Mm -hmm. And if we dummy that down, then we're not really honoring and serving the person whom we're coaching. And right. so the job of coach is to let is to help an athlete visualize more of achieving more than they've ever mm -hmm. dreamed of. And then helping them break that down into little micro goals so we can have small victories we can celebrate daily to yep. achieve the people. And if the, if the challenge is too, too small, if the challenge isn't challenging enough, mm -hmm. there's some motivation. We all know that. Right. It's just outside our reach to really ignite our grit and our resilience. Mm -hmm. And it's important to train to be your best, and it's important when you're on the competition floor to believe that you will be successful. Yeah. And if you have done, if you've checked off all your little boxes so that you can leave that event with no regrets, A, you have one, and B, you know what? You're going to come out actually on top of the, the, the podium. Right. Absolutely. So yeah, so like, you know, that mindset is, is so important. That mindset is so important. And for athletes to stay motivated, I mean, right now we're dealing with a tough time uh, throughout the pandemic. We actually have a question from the audience, which is similar to the one that I was going to ask next. But, you know, this turned around. Let me make sure I'm still. She said, Kip Fit says, what would you suggest to athletes now in this pandemic to keep their momentum and their motivation? I really believe in, in helping young athletes set a goal. And it's like when I've been on, when I've spoken with young athletes these last two months, it's been, where do you want to be this time next year? 
Mm -hmm. okay, so let's visualize that. Okay, so, and then whatever that is, okay, so how are we going to get there? Whatever your goal is for this time for May next year, where do you want to be? What do we need to do to get there? And what can we work on right now to, to, to work on all of those things that you may not have time to work on once you get back in the gym or once you get on the field or once you're back at school? Let's work on the things that you like control the controllables. Mm -hmm. Don't fret about the uncontrollables because it's just wasted energy. Right. And focus on the things that you can do now. And <laughs> that's the hard part is that a lot of what – we can all do now are the things we don't like to do right it's, it's the conditioning mm. it's the mental sense it's the folk forcing yourself and helping a child get quiet and yeah. learn how to quiet their minds to be able to and help them visualize themselves being successful and i mean what what an amazing accomplishment if all of these young kids could master Mm. quieting their minds during this time. Wow. Is that something that we don't learn until we're older? Yeah. We time on it. Absolutely. So definitely using this as an opportunity, you know, to take advantage of this time to really quiet your mind, focusing on that mental game. Maybe sometimes when you're in the heat of it, right, in the competition during season, you don't really have all that time to slow down and really take a step back and take that deep breath and realize that, you know, we can still grow during this time. So I think that's such great advice for those athletes going through this right now. And how about those athletes who their season ended early and now they're, they're transitioning. I mean, you just dealt with the transition recently. Can you tell us about that transitioning from being, you know, head coach to now life after sports? What has that been like for you? And kind of what is, what keeps you motivated now? It's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not lying. Uh, for so many years at UCLA, I was there 37 years, I helped our seniors realize mm -hmm. that they're not gymnasts. They're human beings that were blessed with an incredibly strong mind and strong body who chose the sport of gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So now take everything you've learned from that and let's start a new chapter in your life and take everything you learned and go be a superhero in that next thing. And I'm having to live my own words now because the week after I retired, I was on an airplane. I was sitting next to someone and she said, oh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I said, um, I used to be the head coach of the UCLA gymnastics team. And now I'm just me. And I had this identity crisis. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, honey, drop the just. Me is enough. And I was wow. like, okay. Gotcha. So I've had to flip it and yeah. I'm enjoying doing a lot of speaking, doing a lot of things like this. I'm enjoying spreading the word. I did a TED talk um, that begs the question is all winning success. Mm. And I really feel that we have a crisis in this country yep. and the win at all cost cultures that we've created. And sadly, the casualties of that crisis uh, are our children. And there's, mm -hmm. because there's more reports, as we know, of depression and stress and anxiety and yeah. worse things. Right. And that's on us. That's on us coaches. That's on us parents. That's on us adults that are overseeing the development of a child. So I really firmly believe we need to redefine success. We need to be able to spend time with every single one of the children that are under our care and get mm -hmm. to know them and to help them develop what success looks like for them yeah and so you know if you've got a young girl who physically does not have the physical stature to really achieve gymnastics at a high level but she loves it mm -hmm. then let's help define what success is going to look like for her this year right and what those goals are going to look like now mm -hmm. and and stop comparing ourselves to other people um they're part of my ted talk that i a lot that has resonated with a lot of parents because they've yep. they've gotten back to me about it is you know you're either focused on your child winning and the end result or you're really excited about helping your child become a champion in life right and you'll know if you're focusing on the end result 
if you ask questions, if that's all you do. When the kid gets in the car, mm. are you just hammering him? How many points did you score? Did you get an A? Did you win? Did you, you know, it's like enough parents. Enough. Yeah. And if you're really excited about helping your child become the best that they can in this amazing life that they have, you'll ask questions about the process. You'll say, mm. what did you learn today? Right. Help a teammate. Okay, right. what's the thing you hate to do? Did you work hard at that today? Mm. And most importantly, did you have fun in the process of working really, really hard? Oh, I love that. Did you have fun in the process of working really, really hard? Because that's so true. We want to challenge our athletes. We want them to grow, and we also want them to have fun. And you mentioned in that TED Talk, which was amazing, by the way, if you those tuning in, having watched it, definitely check it out. Um, you talked about, you know, we can still create competitors and champions in life without breaking that human spirit. What are some ways that coaches or parents can recognize when that human spirit is broken? Well, first of all, we, all of us need accountability. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, tough love is accountability. And it, when I say have fun in the process, it doesn't mean we're happy and rainbows and sunshine all the time. It's not recess. Yeah. It's working really hard. And I believe that all athletes want to be held accountable, regardless of how great they are. Right. Um, but you'll know that you've crossed the line when it gets personal. Mm. When you say things like, why are you so lazy? Mm. I treat them as lazy. You yeah. don't work hard. You know, instead of saying, you don't work hard, which is an attack, you can say, listen, you know what? I just don't think that you're working as hard as you're capable of. You have got so much more in you to give. Come on, let's do it again. And let's yeah. give 1% better at that today, right now. Okay, you got it? Let's do that. I'll do it with you. I feel that there's a, there's a difference also between dictating change in a child and motivating them to change. Oh, well, that's good. And when you motivate someone to want to do something, they're going through same motions, but they're going through those motions with better intention. Mm. And so yes. the, the result is richer and more grounded in them. Nice. I remember, Marty, um, when I stopped dancing, I was in my 20s, and I literally couldn't find anything exercise to do consistently that I was motivated to do. That I didn't mm. And it was simply because I had no motivation to do it. I didn't want to do it. And then I got diagnosed with breast cancer. And my doctor, I was 55, and my doctor said, I don't care what you do, but you need to find something, physical exercise, especially resistance training, to do at least three to four times a week. Okay, well, guess mm -hmm. what? That was my motivation to, to get through chemotherapy as strong as possible. And so wow. I found Pilates, and I became now almost addicted to it because I was motivated to finally, I was finally motivated to really find that. Mm. Yes. You have that deep why within you to keep you going. And that's amazing. You've overcome so many challenges in your life. I mean, that's one of them right there. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. I want to make sure that we get to them since our time is very brief here. Someone wants to know, you know, what are some of the ways that you can get your teams motivated, pregame activities, uh, fun activities that you do, even virtually, you know, to get the team pumped up and having a good time before competition? Great question. And um, I think that's one thing that I did really well because I'm not good at pregame speeches. So I don't do the grr, rah, rah, go kill them right. speech. But anytime, like my goal before a, a meet was to get the team connected and having fun and loose, right? Mm -hmm. So any silly game they can play that's competitive, like take your socks, roll them in a ball, put a basket over there and start shooting baskets, you know, and just make it competitive it. and gritty and trash talking and the whole bit, all that. Yeah. Fun stuff. yeah. So, um, even virtually, to come up with games like that I had a, um, I had a group after I talked about this, this young group of four girls, they created um, obstacle course slash circuit in their house. Mm -hmm. And so when they went by the stairs, they all had stairs in the house. They turned and they did 20 push-ups and they did 20 dips. And then they ran outside and they had to do run to the fence, run back, run to the fence, right. run to the fence. 
and then they had to come inside, and then they had literally had their socks rolled up in a ball, and they had a bucket, and they were all 10 feet away, and they had to make 10 shots into the bucket. And then, and so they had a little circuit that they did, and they tied right. themselves, and then they won, and they celebrated their win. It was, it was adorable. Yes, I love that fun competition, friendly competition, keep them loose, keep them having fun, and definitely will calm that mind down, right, before they get into those intense moments of competition. And I remember another thing that you mentioned um, was making sure you build trust with your athletes. Like before they have that commitment, they have to be able to trust you, right? And they have to feel that connection. How do you create that connection and that trust with your athletes? And how can other coaches do that? You know, we all know that trust takes a really, really long time to build. We've got to layer it, layer, yeah. layer, layer, layer. And um, it, it, it takes taking the moments every day to get to know your athletes just a little bit better. And it really is as simple as instead of walking by and saying, hey, how you doing? And then walking on is right. taking a moment to stop and look them in the eye and go, how are you today? Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've looked one of my athletes in the eyes and gone, hey, Marty, how are you? And they're, <laughs> they're taking a back by it. They're like, is this a test? Like, why are you asking me this? Because <laughs> I'm curious. How are you? And... Then, you know, you can forge the conversation further when you have more time and make time for them. I think I really turned a corner in my coaching when I made time to have individual meetings with my student athletes, mm -hmm. even if it was just a 10-minute meeting. It was a check-in when I, where I asked them, how, how are you doing? How's your week going? And then the really, really important part is to shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. And... I believe the greatest gift that we can give another person is to quiet our minds from having to formulate that next thought and truly listen right. to how someone is responding to us. I just feel that that empowers them and that builds that trust as of, I really do care yeah. how you're doing today. That's why I asked you the question. And when you can layer those little layers of trust, um, that's when the relationship can really withstand anything. Because we're all going to screw up. Oh, my gosh. I could write a whole book on my blunders. <laughs> but I screwed up. But I learned that the more trust I developed, then when I came back and I sincerely apologized, and I said, I am so wow. sorry. Mm -hmm. This was the reason why I did it, which was totally wrong. Now now I see it's totally wrong. My intention was not to hurt you. Yeah. I, when you build that trust – those apologi apologies can be accepted, and then it act we all know this. When you sincerely apologize, it actually makes the relationship stronger. Yeah. Wow. I heard multiple things in that answer. Number one, the communication. Main part of communicating is listening, right? And, and cre creating that safe space for them to come and talk to you. So that helps build the trust. And then also being vulnerable with your athletes and letting them know when you're wrong and admitting and saying sorry. Wow, that is strong right there. I feel like a lot of coaches um, or parents don't realize how much trust that that can build when you create that space and when you have that vulnerability. I absolutely believe that, you, that when in a relationship, when a parent with a child, I don't care even if you have to create something parent for you to apologize, when you sincerely apologize, first of all, you're modeling behavior of what a mm -hmm. respectful apology looks and sounds like. But when you do that with a child, they're taken aback a little bit because this authoritarian figure is apologizing. It humbles you to them and ingratiates you to them. Yeah. It's a very powerful human connection that, yeah. that makes that relationship. Mm -hmm. We have a question from, oh, one of your former gymnasts, Talia. She said, who are your, or some of your inspirations and role models? Hi, Talia. Oh, Talia Kaczynski is one of yeah. my favorite role models. After, <laughs> um, I am going to say that s seriously. Right. Talia Kaczynski was a non-scholarship athlete on our team. She was quirky. Mm -hmm. she was like goofy 
like you didn't realize she was as smart as she was because she was just so so uh quirky is a is a great word for her she came across as gay, but in a like baby bay way from friends you know <laughs> yeah but the thing that i loved about talia and i loved talia being on our team was talia was 100 percent true to her who, who she was yeah. her spirit talia never tried to be like anybody else mm -hmm. but talia and such a gift especially coaching a, as you well know marty coaching a group of girls they're all comparing themselves to each other they want to be right. like they want to be prettier i've had girls on my team ask me do you think she's prettier than i am and it's like oh my gosh oh my gosh where do i start with this talia was a great example for our entire team of how to live life with gratitude joy appreciate and self-love and self-worth even so she rarely competed for us mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. she had strength this appreciation that came from it really came from gratitude i love that yeah so yeah. Hi, yes, and I've had the pleasure of befriending so many uh, gymnasts. Talia's one of my closest friends, Sam Peshik, so many gymnasts, um, and they all just speak so highly of you, and it's just clear that coaching, or your coaching philosophies have gone far beyond just, um, you know, the playing field. It's, they've, it's prepared them for life beyond the sport, and it's just been incredible to be able to be such close friends with so many people who played for you. Um, I do want to ask this question. You know, if we were to go back to your coaching days and they were to tell you there was no championship at the end of the season, no championship trophy, no NCAA uh, trophy, no bonus check for winning, nothing like that, would you still coach the same way that you did? Absolutely. Because I honestly did not enjoy the competitions. Wow. I, I wasn't like this, like, can't wait to get on the floor and just kill him. I had to, I, I figured out how to enjoy competitions by, mm -hmm. in my mind, it was a celebration of, of all of our hard work. That's and good. so that, when I, when I started spinning mm -hmm. before about, are we going to win? How are we going to win? Who's better than we are? What am I going to do? Have I checked okay. off the boxes? Blah, blah, blah. I made myself sick to my stomach and I didn't enjoy them at all. Wow. And it literally wasn't until after cancer that, you know, you're, you get hit with something like that and your whole thought process of life flips that I was, I appreciated every moment with these young women and coaching them and then them blossom and seeing these performances and I took that onto the competition floor with mm -hmm. them. And I remember mm -hmm. Dick Francis said to me after that first national championship that that season that I was going through chemotherapy said Miss Val I've never had so much fun competing in all of my life because wow. you were having fun you weren't stressed out and you yes. allowed me not to be stressed out and then I thought you know, coaches that get really stressed and they're walking around like this. Okay, that's hypocrisy because you train your athlete to be yeah. and not stressed and positive and all that. So if you're going to be strutting up and down the sidelines all in this tense little stress ball, yep. you're being a hypocrite. And I realized mm -hmm. that I had been being a hypocrite. Mm. But you know what, Marty? Part of it was I had to posture like that in my mind. So that people would know, like my boss, our chancellor, the fans would know, I took this really seriously. Mm. It's, it was it was crazy. It was absolutely yeah. crazy. Wow, that's such good advice. And I mean, although you are no longer coaching in the traditional sense, you are still coaching us all in life. Honestly, I've learned so much from you from, you know, having these types of conversations, watching your TED Talks from your book, Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. Those out there tuning in, thank you so much for tuning in today. And I know we've all learned and continue to learn from you, Ms. Val, uh, just your co contribution to not only sports, but just 
you know, the world has just been amazing and tremendous. And I appreciate you on behalf of Positive Coaching Alliance. We want to say thank you for your time today. And thank you to all those that have tuned in. We're going to wrap up right now, but I just wanted to give you one more shout out and say we appreciate you and love you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bonjour, Lena. Yes. Love you. Bye, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye.